What's up guys and gals, welcome back to the Nerd Castle for another episode of Shadowrun Dragonfall. In the previous episode, we had finally gotten into the vault upstairs, we had gotten ourselves a killer drone, some drug recipes, we had gotten ourselves some schematics for something random. I don't know, it seems like this game is going to have crafting or something in it. It hasn't been introduced to us as of yet, but it would be really, really cool if they did add that, or add that facet to the game, I guess. The only thing left to do now is we've looted every single floor. We're going to go back down to the ground floor club, and we're going to hope that this thing doesn't erupt into instant violence the moment we step out of the hallway. Oh good, the only thing thumping right now is the music. We don't have to worry about machine guns or anything trying to shred us in half. I thought that was like a levitation dancing machine, it was like a future stripper pole or something. I was about to be really impressed, I'm like, wow, you can dance up in midair and stuff now? That's, that's pretty badass, man. Technology, moving the important things forward in life. <laughs> like, what? We have diseases and stuff everywhere. Let's not cure those. You know what we need? We need stripper poles that levitate. <laughs> Humanity. It's always got its priorities straight. Let's talk to Silk and make sure that we get our secondary objective done. I'm not gonna... She's already a junkie. We're not gonna press the junkie for extra stuff. Really? You actually went up there and got my things? She stares at the items in her hands incredulously. And you didn't just walk off with them? Wow. Thank you. When you said that you were going up there, I didn't think... I just, her lip starts to quiver. Thank you. Alright, and so we didn't get anything out of that quest, but we were a good human being. So there is its own pragmatic rewards to that, I guess, or their own moral rewards to being a good human being. I want to punk the bartender, too. Oh, that's right, we can sell off some of this garbage that we have. Let's sell off some of the things that we picked up in this last, because I'm not going to use any of the drugs or anything, I don't think. We'll get rid of all the drugs. We're not going to make much money off of them. We're going to keep the Ares Predator, because it's got a data jack. Hopefully... It says that the data jack is required, and so we're really going to have to kind of hope that Glory already has one. I assume that as chipped up as she is, she probably already has one. Let's take a look. Jump into our inventory for just a moment and see what kind of cyberware she has. You're like, if you think about it, like what we're really doing right now is we're kind of like strip searching her. If you go to her inventory and you're just looking at all of her cyberware, because obviously all of it's underneath her clothing or something. But nope, we're just kind of... Okay, so she needs a data jack in order for this to work. She does have pistol skill, though, so let's go... So she's got pistol... Oh, she only has pistol one. I wonder when we get to upgrade our, our teammates' skills, because their skills seem very, very low for where I want them to be. Like, even her close combat is pretty terrible, given the fact that she has hand razors. Or razor claws, or whatever they're calling them nowadays. Back in my day, they were called razor claws, and they popped out from underneath the old fingernails. I guess I don't want to talk to him either. I got nothing to turn in here. Let's just get the hell out of Dodge before this whole thing collapses on us because I feel like we've got a bunch of storyline to handle. I'd be trying to convince this guy to join my team. He's kind of scary. He also likes comic books, so that's a plus on both ends. That is a friend you want to make if you're a skinny, nerdy mage like I am. Hey, thanks for the assist. Can't tell you how happy I am to leave this place behind. Happy to help. It must have been terrible to be stuck back in here. Well, it was no picnic, I'll tell you that much. Hey, say, you wouldn't happen to need a Nova Hot Decker, would you? Because I uh, suddenly find myself unemployed. As it happens, we could use a Decker, yeah. Excellent, fantastic, I promise you won't even regret this for a second. Blitz has joined your team. Amazing, so now we've got everything handled. I don't know if we're going to get even more teammates in the future. It would be awesome if we did. I'd like to have a little bit of a selection. Your team makes its way back to the nearest U-Bahn station. 20 minutes later, you're on a trip to the cruise baser, leaving the filth of the Dragon Keeper behind. But, for the image of Green Winter's twisted corpse, it still lingers in your mind. You lift one of the discs that you pulled from Winter's safe to the light. Reflections dance off of its surface. With luck, you'll soon have the answers that you've been looking for. Sorry about that little lag right there. My eyes started itching really badly, and I was like, Oh my god, I need to handle this itch right this moment, or something terrible is going to happen. Hopefully we're not... Okay, I have this bug. I told you guys, I get stuck on loading screens all the time, so anytime this little bar stops moving, I'm horrified. I just sit there and I, I just... I quiver. I quiver in fear that I will not be able to continue playing this super awesome game. Wow, we got eight karma, so we've got stuff to spend, and we've got to go discuss the findings with Amsel. I'm also going to do a little bit of a run around here to figure out where everything else is at. So, obviously, that's our import shop where we've been working out of. I wanted to find a weapon store, because that's the one thing that I didn't lock down while we were out here. Kami's outside the building. That was the magic shop. 
There's got to be a gun broker around here somewhere. Somebody that's willing to slang that steel to us. Guess I haven't talked to any of these guys. Let's go to talk and we'll talk with Samuel Beckenbauer. At the sound of your approach, the orc turns to face you. He wears a severe expression, but there's kindness in his eyes. Guten Tag, Elf. Can I help you with something? I didn't hear anything. I couldn't help but over I overhear your conversation. I take it that you run a charity of some sort? He nods. Yes, it isn't much, but we do what we can. Such as? Give me some specifics. He clears his throat and then begins to count off on his fingers. In the past several years, I've established a shelter where the dispos... The dispossessed can sleep, a soup kitchen to feed the hungry, and a library for the people of the cruise baser to better themselves. It isn't much, I admit, but it is a start. A good start, Samuel. You mustn't be so hard on yourself. There are limits to what one man, even a determined man, can accomplish. This is true. He nods to the orc at his side. Thankfully, some of the residents that I've helped over the years have come back around to help me. I've got 15 assorted orcs and trolls from all around the cruise baser working with me now. They help me with the soup lines, stock the library shelves, and do all of the hundreds of other little things that a community organization needs done every day. These extraordinary individuals are living proof that what we do here has value. They are my inspiration to continue forward. She beams at the compliment. From her body language, it's clear that she idolizes Beckenbauer. Now, do you have any more questions? If not, I, I'll bid you good day. I don't wish to sound self-important or rude, but there are many pressing matters that demand my time. Are you accepting donations? Yes, of course. We're actually desperate for them, truth be told. People seem more intent on taking care of themselves than they are on providing for the less fortunate. Of course, these concepts are not unrelated. As poverty rates increase, so does the crime rate. Assisting the needy increases the quality of life for all. In any rate, our shelter has become our, our shelter has some basic needs that desperately need to be filled. The walls of the shelter are not insulated, and new blankets would go a long way towards keeping our guests healthy and comfortable. Ideally, we'd like to purchase some space heaters as well. With 250, you could make the purchase. Of course, I don't expect you, a relative stranger to our kids, to contribute that much. However, whatever you could spare would be most appreciated. I'm going to hold back right now until we're good. A common refrain. He gives you a sad smile. I appreciate the thought, though, all the same. So we'll come back. I wasn't planning on giving a whole bunch of money there right now. We haven't gotten ourselves equipped as it stands. Let's talk to Lane. Before you stands a troll, though it is a stretch to say he's standing at all. His great mass is barely held upright by two vintage prosthetic legs, along with a crutch under one arm. His body clicks and hums with every shift of his weight. Despite these disabilities, his eyes are sharp and calculating. I know you. I should hope so. One of Monica's runners, then, is it? Few others wield an ego that big. I'm three-toe, by the way. Good to meet you, three-toe. Name's Alexi Lane. What's your place in the cruise baser? No place, really. Just an old relic rusting away. There's something you should know about Monica. Something happened to her on the run. How'd you know? It was written all over your face. I had a feeling. Besides, Monica almost always comes around after a run to check on everybody. She's long overdue, and now here you are in her place. So she's either severely wounded or outright dead. Which is it? I'm afraid she's gone. The grizzled troll nods grimly. The servos in his prosthetics complain as he lets loose a heavy sigh. Now that is a shame. She was a hell of a runner, that one. And a good friend. I'll leave you be. Not the gun runner. We're just bringing sunshine to every corner here. Who is that? Zach Flash. So he's the drug dealer. We've also got Simi. Did I talk to Simi already? Warming herself in the dim light of a dying street lamp is a waif of a girl who looks far too worn for her years. The clothes she wears suggest the oldest profession, and the fog in her eyes suggests a habit that demands such a line of work. The Mother Superior, she says there will be seven for me to care for, and I need to see them. Your height's a kite, aren't you? We could fly kites. I should ask Mother Superior. She says I'm to be governess to the children. You notice a chipjack poking out beneath the young woman's unruly hair. The vacant look in her eyes marks her as a likely BTL junkie, lost between reality and any number of better-than-life virtual constructs. I need money to get back to him. Story sounds familiar. Captain Von Trapp is very well known and respected. The poor dear lost his wife and the children her mother. A child should not be without a mother, and a mother should not be without a child. Have you seen the captain? Look, do you know Monica? Monica? Is she one of the sisters at the Abbey? No, wait, Monica. A flicker of recognition fights through the haze in the young woman's eyes. Yes, Monica. She's good to me, brings me food to eat and tea to drink. Something happened to her. Despite the woman's persistent delirium, she seems to glean meaning from your tone. She died? That's right. The girl grips her head with claw-like hands, tugging at her hair as though she might pull her brain out through her skull. I don't like this, but I can't switch it off. The girl's frail body shudders and her eyes grow large, but she does not sob. 
Instead, she smiles a sad smile, which looks to have been worn all too often. She'll go to heaven, she told me. It's a place for good people, stillborn babies and childhood pets. And she was a good person. The girl then begins to mumble to herself while fingering the hair that covers the jack on her head. I'm gonna step away now. Yes, I, I need to rejoin the children. Well, no gun store as of yet. What was this again? I forget what this was. Or if we even went in in the first place. Oh, triage cyber clinic. That's right. I don't see anything that we can nick here. So, I suppose we'll just leave the place be. We won't be a thief for now. Even though we've brought our handy-dandy backpack, which is the best thieving object to have, or pockets sewn into your pantaloons. I don't see a gun broker around anywhere, so I suppose we'll ski daddle on out of here. Gunari Metbok. Did we talk to him? The Romani Patriarch is an impressive figure, an enormous man in his late 60s, burly and broad-chested despite his age. His voice is deep and resonant, and his breath is heavy with the stench of, sp of pipe... Uh, Pipes tobacco. Tavenbach Stale, elf. And I probably butchered that as well. You're here to conduct some business. If so, I welcome you to Metbach Arms and Ammunition. If not, keep right on walking. Okay, so there it is. I have cash and ID weapons. Show me the goods. See what he has here. Got max power pistols. Got some really cool stuff here. Tasers and things, it looks like. Seems as though they've upgraded the amount of guns that exist within the confines of the game. Well, there's nothing here that I want to buy just yet. But there are some nice things to be had, for sure. As for outfits, we have Securetech Armored Clothing. But I'm not sure if that's something we're going to be able to give to our friends. It's one of those big things that I haven't been able to do any of the customization just yet. So until we get to the point where the customization of our characters becomes available, I'm scared to spend on anything aside from myself. We've got 13 karma, which is a lot. If you had 13 karma sitting in the normal pen and paper game, you'd be rolling in it. I think we should probably spend a bit of time giving ourselves some ranged combat options. So I'll probably go up to like range 3. So that's 6 to be spent right there. I don't want the extra weapon slot, so maybe we'll just go up to there. And then we do need to give ourselves a weapon that we're decent with. Now, I am a fan of pistols. But I do like the possibility of a shotgun if anybody rushes me, since we are a mage. If anybody gets really, really close, mages are denied close range options to deny enemies space and kind of knock them back. Kind of a buffer zone. So I think a couple levels of shotgun might be a good idea. We can't go up to three. But I think that'll do for now. And then with our other stats... Let's have a look at willpower. Spellcasting's where it needs to be right now. We have enough to go up to Karma 7, which means that we're almost demi-godlike as, as kind of a fast talker. Or we could go up to 4 right there and then take Spirit Control 3. I think that may be the better option considering our charisma is pretty damn good already. So I'm going to do Spirit Control 3 and Spirit Summoning 4. And so that'll allow us to wrangle spirits a little bit better as we go through the game. I'm going to confirm those changes. And so now we're strapped in and ready to go with a sawed-off Benelli, which is nice. We have an option that was previously not available to us. This was a gun that I was steering away from in most of our combats because we didn't have a very good hit chance. Even at point blank, I think we were only at like 57%. So now with two skill, we should be able to engage up to six or seven squares pretty reliably after we dot people up with some of the acid. Hopefully this place hasn't been raided since we last left. Let's check in with Andre. You've always got to check on the dog first. You look down to see a pair of bright eyes set into a scruffy face looking back up at you. Dante, Monica's old dog. Looking down into those huge brown eyes, you see intelligence and sadness. On some instinctive level, he must know that his master is gone. Dante lets out a small whine, then rubs his head against your leg. Give him a pet. Woof. Damn right, Woof. I'm training you to be a killer. I'm going to replace all your doggy legs with cyber doggy legs and your eyes with cyber doggy laser eyes. And you will be a weapon of destruction. The world will fear you. You will be the new Firewing. Although you'll be Firepaw. Ansel's expression is harder than you've seen it before. When he speaks, his voice is grim. Igris told me of Green Winter's death. She said he died the same manner that Monica did. Well, it wasn't a pretty sight. 
Ansel nods gravely. I know that you and Iger have had your differences. I will tell you that she was badly shaken by the sight of Winter's body. She also mentioned that she found something in Winter's safe, a package full of very old discs. May I see them? Of course. Good God. Gingerly, Ansel lifts a disc from the bundle and holds it up to the light. Slowly, he begins to turn it in his hand, causing rainbow patterns to shimmer across its surface. I haven't seen one of these since I was a boy. This is a DVD rewritable, a data storage medium from the mid-2000s. I'm amazed that Winters was able to find a device that could play it. Do you know how we could read these things? He puts down the DVD in his hands and quickly inspects the others. The first disc that I looked at might be readable. The others are damaged, some severely so. I have my doubts about them. For now, let's concentrate on the undamaged disc. There's a little shop outside called the Data Haven. Talk to the proprietor, Malit Hoyli, or Malit Holyi. She might be able to help. Tell her to put the cost or tell her to put the cost of the device on my account. I'm on it. Hey, boss. Dietrich gives you a slight nod. What can I do for you? How you holding up? You seem to take Monica's death harder than the others did. Dietrich shakes his head, a wistful expression on his face. Nah, no harder, but I'm less buttoned up than the others are. I girl never let herself show any weakness and glory. Well, she's too full of chrome to feel much of anything. He shrugs. Me, I just don't give a damn. I've spent too much of my life putting on a show for others already. What do you mean by that? I used to front a punk band way back when. Believe it or not, I spent a pretty good chunk of my life on stage. Whenever we weren't playing, I was living up to our fans' expectations. Spouting off, getting into fights, getting drunk, getting laid. Not a bad life, all things considered. What was your band called? Maybe I've heard of it. Oh, I doubt it, boss. We never really got any airplay. Come on, Diedrich, tell me. All right, boss, if you insist. The band was called Messerkampf, spelled just like it sounds in big capital letters with an exclamation point. We weren't a big act or anything. We sold a few records here and there and toured around Europe. We had a decent following in England, and we holed up in London from 31 to 36, spent most of our time slumming it around the East End, and picked up enough cockney to irritate the folks back home. He shakes his head. Truth be told, that whole chapter of my life is a bit of a blur. We didn't do it for the fans or the fame, and we sure as shit didn't do it for the money. All that mattered to us was staying young, drunk, and angry. He takes a moment to examine his gnarled hands, a sad smile on his face. We managed the second two. Good God, where has the time gone? Dietrich shakes himself from his reverie and looks up at you. That familiar easy grin returns to his face. Well, anyways, boss, everything ends eventually, and I washed my hands of all this years ago, so let's change the subject if you don't mind. Any thoughts about the last run you'd like to share? Well, we found Winters, and that's something, I guess. The whole thing has me feeling uneasy, boss, but at least we've got some direction to look in. How'd you go from a band to running in the shadows? Wasn't as big a leap as you'd think. I already had a healthy disrespect for authority, and I had the magic to back it up. One nice thing about shamanism, as long as you keep your icon happy, it doesn't matter what else you do. The Dragon Slayer chose me to be his servant, and as long as I was scrapping with someone bigger than me, he didn't care much whether I did it on stage or in the shadows. Tell me about the Dragon Slayer. He shrugs. There's not much to tell. He chose me when I was just a kid. I could feel him in my heart, goading me to laugh louder, hit harder, and get rowdier than the rest. Of course, my family didn't understand, but to hell with him, I thought. I knew that I was destined for greater things. So I listened to him, and I cracked the skulls of a lot of bad people. He saw it and was pleased and rewarded me with magic. And I used that magic to crack bigger, thicker skulls, and so on. He shrugs. It's a simple life, but a good one. Lots of other conversations to be had, so we may write out the rest of the episode like this. Iger turns to face you. There's a pained look on her face. Look, I, uh, I owe you an apology. Oh, is that so? Yeah, it is. When Monica died, I was pissed. That probably doesn't come as a huge surprise, but I took that anger out on you, and I shouldn't have. Seeing Winter's body like that was enough to convince me. You couldn't have done anything to help Monica, and I couldn't have either. We're dealing with something new. Monica was a good friend of mine, and her death hurt. I got carried away, and I said some things that I shouldn't have. I want to apologize for that. Her body relaxes, and she begins to turn away. Anyways, that's all that I wanted to say. There are a few things that I wanted to say. She stops and turns back to face you. You can see the weariness behind her eyes. Her wariness. I'm missing an E. Go ahead. Ain't nobody stopping you. I'm gonna smooth things over. You're a valued member of the team, Iger. We need you now more than ever, and I'm glad that you're on my side. She raises a hand to stop you. The expression on her face has gone from cautious to annoyed. Uh, cut the bullshit, fearless leader. I don't respond well to flattery. I wasn't trying to flatter you, Iger. I just wanted to tell you how... How wonderful and valuable I am. Yeah, I got that part. And now that you've given me a pat on the head, I suppose you'll expect me to fall in line like a good little soldier. You know, there's nothing easier or more hollow than an empty compliment. It's cheap manipulation. I can always see right through it. 
She turns away. You should go. I've got prep work for our next run. You've got more important things to do than watch me pack my gear. She is a Pokemon on the surface. She's definitely got her thorn spell running. Max vo max velocity. Three toe, what do you need? Well, I guess we'll try Astral Perception. I don't like it. It seems a bit invasive to me, but we'll do it just to see what the game spits out. Without shifting your attention away from glory, you allow your consciousness to partially slip into the astral plane. As your third eye opens to the hidden world around you, you feel the familiar tingle of dormant senses awakening. The room you're standing in slowly shifts to match its true nature, a lifeless expanse of gray, ugly, and cold. Your own body, however, explodes into a swirling chaos of scintillating color. If I do say so myself, that seems a tad... It seems a little egotistical, but maybe my body is colorful. I don't know how it, how it compares chromatically to everybody else's. As the astral plane shimmers into view, you focus on Glory. You can still see her with your corporeal vision, her delicate frame, the bulky cyberware that breaks her silhouette, the faraway look in her eyes. But laid over the top of her physical body, there's a slight shimmer, her aura, damaged though it may be. The chrome that Glory is sporting has really done a number on her. Whatever she may have been before she went under the knife, Glory's aura is now reminiscent of the room that she's standing in, a cold, dead thing, mockingly sculpted in the facsimile of life. Somewhere within that mutilated aura, a shred of humanity awaits, but finding it isn't going to be easy. Suddenly, Glory's body language changes. The look on her face is somewhere between suspicion and alarm. I got something in my teeth? You're staring. With an aura this shredded by cyberware and surgery, it's going to take a minute to gather any useful information. Let's we can <laughs> convince her that she does have something in her teeth. And then we can we can be honest and we can say that we're trying to figure her out. We can say that she does have something in her teeth. Well, let's be honest. I mean, I don't know how she's... I'm going to see how she responds to honesty. And if that's not the case, then later on we'll lie. But just trying to figure you out, Glory. You got a lot going on beneath the surface. I imagine that we all do, yourself included. And yet you don't find me gawking at you. As Glory speaks, you continue to focus, sifting through the void left by her vintage chrome to find the tatters of her original essence. Finally, you catch a glimpse of color, a flash of Glory's true self, and behind it something else. In a reflexive panic, your third eye slams shut. The hidden world of the astral plane disappears from view, but an afterimage of what you saw remains, twisting in your mind. Glory is, or was, ma magically active. The shred of her essence that flitted past your vision left you sure of it. What's more, you'd wager that she had real power once. Terrifying power of a sort that you can only guess at. All of this was surprising, but it was what you saw behind her aura that chilled you to the core. There was something connected to Glory's essence, a metaphysical tether stitched into the fabric of her soul. It reminded you of a leash. You can't say for sure what was holding onto the other end, but whatever it was, it was enormous, ancient, and cruel. But you can't shake the feeling that as you looked at it, it stared back at you, Nietzschean. Trembling, you find yourself back in the mundane world. Glory is still staring at you, her, neut her neutral expression ever so slightly tinged with annoyance. Hey, Glory, how are you holding up? Don't worry about me. I'm solid. You sure? You look like you're a million miles away. I'll be with you when it counts. Right now, it doesn't. Got a question for you, Glory, of the personal kind. I'm not big on sharing, sport. Personal reasons. You understand, I'm sure. The edge in her voice tells you that she's not interested in continuing this conversation. Of course, we all have our secrets, but if you ever want to talk, I'm here. I suppose we should probably go check in. We got a little bit of time left, so let's go talk to Malit, and after that we'll break off the episode. It's going to be one of those conversational blocks, unfortunately. I know how you guys love those. Are you coming with us? Alright, so it appears as though Dante is strapping in for the ride. That's good. I like to have a little bit of doggy protection at my side. Never hurts. Welcome back. What can I do for you? Let's give her the drone first since it's lit up in green. I uh, acquired this drone. Can you get it up and running again? Yeah, probably. It'll take a bit of doing, though. I love working on these old corp drones. Can't make you any guarantees, but either way, it's on the house. I'll leave it in your hands. I'll start on it right now. I'll see you later. I'm looking for something that can play back a DVD rewritable. Really? That's some old tech. Really old, in fact. Just a minute, let me go look. She turns to rummage through a brin of obsolete components at the back of her stall. Ah, here we are. The dwarf rustles a mid-sized flat screen display out of the bin. This display has old enough hookups to connect to a DVD player. RCA, you know? Vintage. The player itself, though, I don't really have. You may wish to try your luck down at the junkyard. There's a scavenger there, a primitive man with a crude disposition. If anybody here in the cruise baser can help you find your DVD player, it'll be him, but he'll almost certainly attempt to overcharge you for it. She takes a deep breath and smiles at you. But you're not here for gossip. Shall we conclude our business? I'll give you the display for, say, 200 new yen. 
Paul Amsel said to charge it to his account. Ah, very well. I'll have it packaged up and delivered to Herr Amsel right away. Best of luck finding that DVD reader. I wish you well. So let's head to the junkyard. I'm going to do it in the next episode, though. So my name is Splattercat. Thank you for joining me here in the Nerd Castle for another episode of uh, Shadow Raw Dr Shadowfall. Oh my god. I'm just mixing things up like crazy right now. Shadow Run Dragonfall. Made by Hairbrain Schemes. I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Take care out there, everybody, and be safe out in the shadows, chummers.